Thanks a lot for those who uh, haven't heard my presentation in the morning. Uh, my name is Pyotr Pachinshikov. Thank you for pronouncing it correct. Uh, correctly. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not now. I'm not going to talk about myself, but uh, I'm going to point out it's nice that there are still so many people, because uh, the usual case in the last panel discussion or last presentation is that uh, you know people are getting less and less. Once I was participating at seminar where I had to to hold a speech after the lunch, and after me there was only one speaker more. And uh, when I came into the uh, room, there was sitting just one person. And I was coming to him and joking, you know, like, good that at least you are here. And he said, yeah, well, I am the next speaker. <laughs> so luckily, it's not the case now. Uh, it's nice that there are still some people sitting here. And in the end, it's not about amount. It's about quality, as we know. So we have uh, uh, very interesting, from my point of view at least, very interesting speakers. And if you agree, uh, I'm not going to present every one beside the names, of course, uh, because uh, as I did it with myself, I prefer people to tell about themselves themselves. Uh, I think it's the best way to present. Uh, and first presenter on stage will be uh, Olga Praskurova. She's from Latvia, and I don't say more. <laughs> Please welcome. Uh, the next one will be Alicia Lagashina. She's from Estonia. Welcome. And uh, the last but not the least one will be Digis Melbixis. Please welcome. So, uh, and uh, after we have presentations. I might ask some questions and maybe one question, and uh, I will have a look if some questions would arrive. If not, then the space will be open and you can just raise your hand and, and uh, uh, ask the question or comment on some of topics. So please, in, in our order, the first one to present would be Olga. Please. Um, hello. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Tere, Labdien, Labadiena, Dobri Dien. Hello once again. When um, when Peter told me that I would uh, introduce myself, I tried to draft the introduction, draft number one draft number two, draft number three, because it's such a challenging task to, to be a human book, <laughs> you know, like we all learned today what is meant to be a human book in a human library. So I would be, you know, I will try to be very brief about myself. Um, my name is Olga Praskurova, as you can see, and I'm from Latvia. And during one small talk in London last year, um, I had a vis-a-vis -vis who asked me, oh, Olga, hi, you're from Latvia, right? You're Latvian. I was like, uh, yes, but I'm Russian-speaking Latvian. So you're Latvian, right? Well, I said, not exactly. And, um, and, and then the conversation uh, continued, and I always uh, was thinking about it. Uh, after the conversation, why I was stressing myself, this, you know, Russian-speaking Latvian, why it is so important for me, uh, why it is important for me to um, add this information that the person probably didn't need to know about me. But that's uh, the personal background. The professional background is uh, the following. I was uh, for 20 years connected with media. I started um, at the end of the 20th century um, being a TV reporter for the tiny city channel in Riga. Then I went uh, to um, report for Latvian public television as a reporter, then a TV news producer, presenter. Then I was editor-in-chief of the uh, publishing house, which was called News Media Group. Um, I was also uh, lecturing at the uh, uh, University of Latvia and guest lecturing at Tallinn University, which I was very honored to do. Um, but my last two jobs are of the most 
of the big interest, uh, probably for you. So in 2014, I was invited by the Latvian Public Service Television to create uh, a unit, a special unit at the TV uh, station, which is called uh, Russian Language um, News Department. So it was uh, decided to enlarge and uh, enlarge and. Um, news uh, section and uh, production at the Latvian television, so I was editor-in-chief back then. And then I moved to uh, media literacy projects, and then Actis came into my life, uh, Actis Strategy, which is a British company, which uh, in 2017, if, not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, had a grant to uh, support independent uh, Russian uh, language media in the Baltics, and they had an idea uh, to create a Baltic media accelerator in the region. So it's like, I know what is Baltic, I know what is media, what is an accelerator? Um, so I was a traditional journalist for 20 years. So the word accelerator, incubator, hub, was something really, really puzzling for me. And then uh, I learned what it is. So um, I put it very, in a very serious manner, what the Baltic Accelerator was meant to be by the initial idea of the Actus strategy. You can read it, you may not read it, but um, the, the fact was that we were looking for some innovative Russian language projects in the Baltic region, uh, which would approach uh, content production in a very um, new way, in a startup way, in a informal or uh, innovative way. And um, we created such a structure that um, would enable advisory board to select the projects for the accelerator. Uh, it was not based in Riga, Tallinn or Vilnius. Um, it was um, created in a kind of, uh, in, a, in an air. Uh, we moved a lot uh, around the Baltics so with the teams, uh, but uh, uh, before we started, we made um, a research, pre-launch research in 2017, uh, with the research question, um, are really there in the Baltics shared places of spaces where startup people, where media people, uh, where Russian speaking, where Latvians, Estonians, uh, Lithuanians can come together to create content? Are there really uh, places out there where you can uh, produce content um, in an innovative way? And um, so we made this research, we made uh, 40, around 40 interviews with the uh, field experts. We went to Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania to interview NGO experts, uh, startup industry experts, content producers and academia. And we found out <laughs> very interesting idea, uh, very interesting facts that uh, people are thinking about innovative approaches. Uh, people are doing great jobs in startups, in media, in uh, academia, researching uh, the problems. NGOs are doing the great job. But do they intersect? Not really. Uh, in uh, Estonia, the picture was uh, in the best shape. I would say. We found uh, that startup industries uh, meet together with creative industries and they try to uh, find synergy there. Like Digix um, at um, Tallinn University Object is uh, uh, in Ida Viruma regions. So we made really uh, clever charts <laughs> about what we found out. And uh, this um, key findings or lessons learned were on different levels, language, um, uh, language at startups industry, uh, common spaces, um, what academia thinks about it, uh, what uh, efforts uh, do governments um, really make to, to build this common or shared places. And again, um, Everywhere there was a kind of sad picture about the situation, um, maybe except Estonia in, in some, in some uh, respect. 
So when we launched uh, the Baltic Media Accelerator in uh, autumn 2017, uh, we produced um, a web page where um, applicants any media, any team, regardless language, uh, regardless uh, um, existence on the market or if there were newcomers to the market, where they could uh, apply with their project and uh, the accelerator promised to them if they would win to enter the accelerator that they would have financial support uh, and acceleration program for three months. Uh, acceleration and growth program. Uh, we had very interesting and distinguished partners who uh, helped us to evaluate the projects. So we had um, an idea of uh, equality already um, kind of incorporated in the selection process. So the experts were from Estonia, two from Estonia, two from uh, Latvia, two from uh, Lithuania, who made the final decision. And those experts were um, Estonian-speaking and Russian-speaking, Lithuanian-speaking and Russian-speaking, Latvian-speaking and Russian-speaking. And we had um, uh, social media experts from Britain as well. And um, the the main things, the main selection points for the projects, uh, for the applications were um, four, actually, that the project should have had um, uh, sustainability pro prospects, that the project uh, should have had innovative approach to media production, uh, the project should address Russian uh, audience uh, also, like including Russian audience, and um, the project should have a social impact. So we were very lucky to receive 72 applications from around the Baltics. Uh, we were expecting around 30. So when we got 72, it was a big number for us. Um, for the first round, 22 um, projects were selected to go further. And then we had the more opportunity to, to select only three winners for the acceleration program. And um, as you can see, um, the statistics of the countries, so um, Latvia had uh, a bit uh, more uh, shortlisted projects, Estonia and Lithuania a bit less, but we also had pan-Baltic projects and uh, uh, some um, international projects as well. Uh, so the key findings out of selection process were uh, the following, that the professional media community in the Baltics clearly understood the need to be innovative in order to reach wider audiences. A demand existed for different, different levels and forms of capacity building, um, content production, social media, uh, audience engagement. The new skills uh, needed to work with audiences and social networks, and they are largely missing. Startup and media communities have different agendas. Sectors do not intersect to create in 2017. And hyperlocal topics need to be addressed specifically. And hyperlocal, I mean uh, the topics that are interested to uh, such areas as Daugavpils area in Latvia, Idavirumai in Estonia, Visaginas area in Lithuania. Um, so the three, the three projects that were selected by the committee uh, were, and you can see they are three from all three different countries. It was not intention to select one from Estonia, one from Latvia, from one from Lithuania, but they scored the highest. The highest. So uh, the project uh, from Lithuania is called Nanuk. And if there are people from Lithuania, maybe you know them. Uh, it's a multimedia project uh, which, is, um, which aims uh, to investigate topics, to go deeper into topics, to talk seriously about serious uh, themes like segregation, migration, etc. It's a very interesting project uh, from Latvia, from Daugavpils, Hello Salanka, which is absolutely unpolitical, but has a very big social impact, impact uh, in the area. And uh, the project from Estonia that was selected is Radio 4, 
and you might uh, be surprised by it because it's uh, public service radio, but we selected this project for the acceleration. Why? Uh, because they had a very uh, innovative idea how to approach younger audiences. They understood that they are uh, losing or they do not have younger audiences, and uh, they created a project that they think would allow them to reach uh, to the youngsters. So these projects were selected uh, in autumn of 2000. Uh, 17, and the acceleration itself uh, represented three stages. So we had th three sprints for the teams. Uh, during the first sprint, uh, we had mentors and professionals who taught them about business planning. Uh, during the sprint number two, we had mentors and professionals who taught them about branding and audience growth. And during the sprint number three, uh, they learned about product development. After each sprint, we had a test day for the teams. So they had to present after the sprint, after the mentorship, uh, what they have learned and how they would apply their new knowledge uh, into their project. So we had every month, we had test days where they pre presented the progress. And that's how we created this kind of shared understanding of Baltic connection. So the test day uh, number one was held uh, in uh, Tallinn, uh, at Tallinn University. The test day number two was held at Vilnius, where we had the partner um, such as uh, Lithuanian um, Journalism Center. The Foundation Week and the Demo Day, as we called it, when they presented their final projects, uh, were held at Riga, uh, at Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, that's how we tried to have this Baltic feeling to the projects, not only on the advisory board level, not only on the application level, but also geographically. So we moved with this project around the Baltics to create this shared understanding. And um, right now, uh, they had a demo day uh, in, in March uh, last, not last year, this year in March in Riga. And um, the, the projects that they um, kind of formulated during the acceleration, how they would be sustainable in future, because it was the task of the acceleration, uh, Nanook, for example, they created a podcast um, which is called Naila Podcast. They regularly make podcasts. Uh, they have a um, fundraising um, page on the Patreon platform where they raise money. They sell podcasts and they're trying, being very small, uh, trying to make uh, small money at the moment, but still money to uh, be sustainable as well. Hello Salanka has, uh, during the acceleration, they developed a different uh, business model for themselves. They uh, make offline and online events. They sell offline events in Daugov Pils. They invite, for example, um, prominent uh, people, celebrities, uh, who are talking about different um, business issues, creative issues, etc. And they uh, send, uh, sell the, the tickets to the events in order to um, sustain uh, their online presence as well. Radio 4, uh, luckily for the Radio 4, <laughs> they do not need to earn money, but uh, they uh, created a platform which is called Kisa FM. For my Russian year, it sounds really uh, challenging, <laughs> Kisa FM, but I was um, uh, uh, kind of told by the uh, project authors that Kisa in Estonian means, you know, buzz, means something that you create around you. Uh, is it right? <laughs> okay, so they, they um, developed this project uh, to address younger audiences uh, on social networks. They, being radio, traditional radio, address younger audiences making videos uh, and uh, making other visual materials on social networks, trying to connect traditional and uh, non-traditional media approaches. 
So I was very pleased to uh, follow all the Facebook pages and activities of our selected projects last year, uh, last summer, for, for last month, for example, and they're still going on. They still published a lot of news. They um, are doing a great job. So we were not wrong um, in choosing them to become the winners. And Nyla has much more followers and much more uh, listeners that then had in March. Hello Solanka is uh, doing Hello Solanka branches in Daugavpils successfully. They're attracting uh, also not only uh, mo not only monetizing monetizing um, project uh, itself, but they attract donors' money. Uh, Radio 4 is uh, growing and. Uh, uh, Kisa FM project is growing and they managed to also to have negotiations with, uh, as I know, uh, with um, their uh, board uh, and they attracted attention also of Estonian speaking colleagues at the public service. So probably they would create this experimental platform altogether, not only for Russian speaking uh, younger audiences, but in both languages. Um, we, um, I guess with this project, we managed to, with Baltic Media Accelerator project, we kind of made the first step for other actors uh, in the market um, to, to think about it uh, in a more innovative way, to, to see the hope there, if we go with the Russian language media, also into kind of startup uh, thinking. Uh, so um, the logical um, uh, step um, during the accelerator was also we, we made a hyperlocal media hackathon in Narva uh, in November last year. We uh, also organized the Baltic Forum for Russian speaking journalists in Riga, having a special section on sustainability and new business models for journalists. Um, our colleagues uh, at uh, Stockholm School of Economics, uh, they had a young media enterprise boot camp uh, last summer here in Tallinn, last May. Uh, our colleagues at Baltic uh, Media, uh, Media Excellence Center in Riga, uh, they created um, a new incubator uh, for Daugavpils region, which is called uh, Media Restart Incubator, etc., etc. And I guess this KISA <laughs> and buzz, <laughs> uh, which should uh, be going on around um, making startup thinking and media thinking coming together is something that we are really uh, looking for and hoping to continue. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you very much, Olga. I think we will uh, leave the time for questions and discussion for later and we invite Alicia on stage. Hello, everybody. My name is Alessia Lagashina. Uh, I didn't prepare a speech about myself. I'm a journalist, a philologist. I have a PhD in Russian uh, literature, but uh, I'm working in journalism almost for 15 years. Um, and I'm going to talk about the local Russian media, uh, common information space, and what is necessary to make our audience to feel at home, to be involved in the most important information and the political processes. I think we all understand here that uh, the question of integration is all actually about home. But do Russians feel at home here? What do they consider their home? If the question is where do you live, the answer is simple. I live in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia. But if we are talking of cultural space, the answer is not so obvious. It's not a secret, for example, uh, that we prefer entertainment con content from uh, Russia, and it's quite impossible to create local Russian star. You can try, but uh, the result is poorer. Um, it's always a problem when a political party asks you, hey, do you know any Russian who is popular and could join our campaign? It's always a very problematic question because it's pretty difficult to find one. And that is one of the reasons because um, why the local advertisements are not as effective as uh, it could be here. Just look at the picture and uh, imagine. 
On the left, uh, you, see, you can see Andrei Malakhov, uh, probably the most uh, popular TV presenter in Russia. And on the right, we can see Zhenya Fokin, uh, a stylist and also a TV presenter, uh, who is more popular amongst the local Russians. I guess um, it's Malakhov, unfortunately. And um, let's imagine a 50, 60 years old uh, Russian woman who watches an advertisement, sees the face of a local star who tells her actually nothing, and uh, it, it just doesn't work. But for some reason, Estonian advertisers are sure that um, they believe he, he is important for her. That's because uh, Russian people with great pleasure watch uh, Russian TV as it is in Moscow. Because, uh, you know, in Moscow they know how to play with my language, uh, they um, know my cultural background, they, um, and they see faces that I know. It's so simple. So it makes me feel at home. The same is with the theater, for example. It's not a secret that our public prefers uh, Russian guest performances uh, to our local theater, so it always has fin financial problems. And um, uh, we all see what is going on with our national broadcasting TV channel, ATV+. I think um, many of us have seen this famous graphic. Everybody knows, actually, that uh, TV channel exists, but uh, nobody actually watches. And its rating is always under 1% of the audience, except of peri periods when uh, there is a football championship. And its uh, ratings... Um, are always a subject of very cruel discussion, very cruel critics um, in uh, Estonian media, including posthumous, unfortunately. Why do we have to pay for it b uh, if the audience has not accepted the channel? It's very usual to, to hear. For me, the answer is obvious. We have to pay for it because um, it has symbolic value. It is the way the Estonian national state shows its respect, its attitude towards uh, minority, and it's attitude to the multicultural society. We do care, we want you to stay with us, and uh, we are interested in what you're thinking uh, about our common interests, our common issues, our common life. Unfortunately, the meaning of this channel is not widely understood yet. The channel's reputation suffers of severe critics from the other media, including posthumous, as I said. And the last scandal in media was uh, hyped up because of the citizenship of the newly appointed editor-in-chief, just because um, she's professional. She has the support of the colleagues, but uh, she has also uh, the citizenship of the Russian Federation. So those people who have no slightest idea of who she is, of her, what her political beliefs are, began to blame her began uh, to criticize, began, began, saying, began to say that um, her citizenship is uh, Russian, so it's unacceptable. And the hype was provoked by some right-wing politicians. So we all know that uh, elections are coming in March. Uh, so everybody tries to, to earn some uh, political points. And it's really disappointed that they are trying to manipulate the media. And the uh, media supports this hype. But on the other hand, for the Russian audience, um, it might be a good sign. You see, she's Russian, she speaks Russian, she's from Russia, she has Russian citizenship, so maybe this channel is not actually Estonian propaganda, as I thought before. Uh, for many of us, uh, all those scandals around uh, ETV Plus show the real attitude towards minority here. Nobody actually interested in the fact that besides ETV Plus and ETV, national broadcasting has also ETV2, for example. Nobody knows uh, who is the editor-in-chief of ETV2 and what its rating. But uh, pff, actually, we don't discuss, we don't want to discuss it. Why? Why we're always discussing ETV Plus? Because uh, its uh, rating is uh, too low, or its quality is too low. No, I don't think so. I think we're talking about it because it's Russian. I beg your pardon if I'm uh, talking too much uh, because uh, if I'm talking too much about the TV channel, channel not posthumous, just because uh, the concept of the ETV Plus is all, is all about integration. And posthumous is a private company which has its uh, commercial purpose as well. But actually, I think Russian media here has one uh, serious problem in common. Uh, there is a lack of certain um, content segments, such as, for example, international policy analysis. 
uh, we have little political discussions. We almost uh, do not talk about uh, foreign affairs, for example. It's very strange because um, uh, there's no such a TV show at the moment for, for the Russians, local, I mean. And uh, if you think of Russian television, um, which is full of so-called so analytical uh, shows, and you know, their rating, ratings are really high. For example, the famous show of uh, Olga Skabeva, Evgeny Popov, you see uh, at the screen, uh, 60 minutes, uh, you can see it every evening uh, on the channel Russia. Well, we all understand it's propaganda, but it's popular. It's a chance to talk about some political issues as well, international affairs. And I think uh, that uh, the ratings are high, uh, not only because it's actually very well done, but because uh, Russian people want to be involved in, in a political process, and Estonian channels uh, doesn't offer such chance. My own experience uh, tells that people are interested in international policies, especially if we're not afraid to take the most controversial issues. Well, okay, when a Russian journalist begins to analyze foreign policy, it's always suspicious. No doubt you will be blamed that you are not a journalist, but a propagandist. No matter if it's Russian or Western propaganda, you can be both at the same time. Uh, so, sometimes it even uh, seems to me that our Russian journalists avoid certain topics because um, they don't want to provoke a conflict within the Estonian editorial. They um, don't want to gain negative attention in Estonian media. And maybe uh, they're afraid that it may be unpleasant to the Russian audience. I think it's a mistake. To be credible, journalism must be brave, must be honest, and not, it, it must not avoid any topic, any issue. But you see, you, the Russian journalist in Estonia is almost always the other. As he's representing minority, as he has another cultural background, and obviously his concept is, of Russia is different. His picture is maybe not black and white as Estonian one, and he's always in the middle of the conflict. You have to communicate different points of view, and at the same time, you have to create that common information space. But the crucial condition of this common information space is credibility. And then um, you have to have same, same values. Actually, I believe that Russian and Estonians in general have the same values. But there are many contradictions in details. For example, we all share the concept of um, the importance of human rights, freedom of speech, um, international law. It's all obvious. But we also see how differently, for example, democratic states react when they see a violation of those fundamental issues. For example, everybody have heard of the murder of Saudi Arabia journalist in the embassy. Now there is another one murdered. But nobody has heard of sanctions against Saudi Arabia. Well, we criticize it, but there is no practical consequences. We all can imagine the reactions if it had happened. For example, in Russian embassy was Russian opposition journalists. We all remember Skripal's case in Salisbury and the consequences. We discussed it the whole summer and we support the sanctions. I do support the sanctions, even, uh, if, they can, um, even if they have a negative impact on our economy as well. But uh, we cannot afford sanctions against Saudi Arabia. Probably it would ruin our economy. So we write a couple of articles. We condemn the murder and go ahead. It was not nice, but let's do not speak about it anymore. So are we still talking about democratic values? Or we have to talk about double standards? On the other hand, when we criticize Western democracies for the absence of principles, don't we behave like Russia today? It's, it's usually a problem. Is a Russian journalist allowed to discuss it without being accused and spreading propaganda? But our readers see that, and they do react. They want a discussion. Actually, I, be, I believe we have to discuss it, and we have to talk together on the most difficult topics, uh, the most difficult issues, and we have to do it um, at the same platforms no matter in what, in what language. It's not enough that Estonian media is translated into Russian. It's not even enough if uh, local Russian TV or online media has its own um, 
discussions. It takes two to tango, and if you want to create a fully integrated society, we have to build it up starting from the media, which can show that different opinion is possible, that everybody and every nation is treated equally, your nation is not stigmatized, and we're all ready to talk to each other. How many media projects in our media companies where Estonian and Russian journalists work together, do you know? There are actually a few of them, like Radar at Channel 2, for example, or PR Tnege inside at ETV, ETV+. Plus. But they're not political shows, it's investigative journalism. And we usually do not discuss politics to go together, we don't discuss economy together, and we almost have no analytics at all. It is certainly a problem of stuff, a problem of money, financial problem. Sometimes it's a language problem because it's very difficult to find someone, um, to find speakers to your show. But it's also a problem of will, I think. Estonians and Russians might have analytical media projects together, which could, could be brought up together, maybe in both languages. Because if we don't collaborate in our media, what do we expect from the society? I think the common elections are a good example of the collaboration, could be, could be a good example of the collaboration between the editorial teams. When a political subject is covered by a joint Estonian and Russian team, there's less chance of a usual deceit when a politician uh, tells one thing to a Russian audience, uh, quite the opposite to Estonian. One of the best examples uh, of such a revelation we had in Postimus uh, a month before or so uh, with Mart Helme from ECRE, Estonian Nationalist Party. Uh, he gave an interview to Russian uh, Postimus and began to talk about specific Russian civilization, that Russians are more than a nation, that um, he would prefer to keep Russian schools, that um, we should not accuse Russia too often, etc., etc. But everybody remembered uh, what he was saying before to Estonians. So it was uh, very, very fun. And I remember this moment when the Estonians uh, translated it, uh, our colleagues, Estonian colleagues translated it uh, into Estonian. So we could have a chance uh, <laughs> to compare uh, the Estonian uh, statements to the Russian ones. And it was uh, really, really fun in our editorial team. <laughs> Actually, I think the, the, that is a good example how this uh, common information space uh, should function. Because, you see, there's no chance uh, to win the elections when uh, your audience understands that you're lying. And you are doing it almost everything. There are a couple of such parties uh, who, uh, which likes to do it. There should be projects which are brought up together there should be translation in both directions of the most important um, issues. But uh, often there's a problem of resources, there's a lack of time, maybe planning could be better. There, uh, there is collaboration in our editorial teams, but there could be more. And to be together, we have to make things together. I would really like uh, if our national broadcast and television channels would show us political debates before the elections in two languages with two hosts, Estonian and Russian one. It's not technically impossible. And you just have to show the will to do it. The collaboration between the editorial teams and the respect towards different population groups could improve, improve the credibility and maybe media reputation Fake news is not actually um, the most important problem. The problem is that sometimes we are ready to believe it. Researchers say about 17% of population uh, doesn't believe mainstream media, so they prefer alternative one. And you never know who can manipulate it. For example, um, last Friday there was a fake um, in local Facebook group, somebody posted a story of a girl um, who was raped and died in Mardo, a small town near Tallinn. Uh, many reports, many comments. Um, colleague calls to the police, uh, controls it. Uh, police uh, tells it's a fake, so we publish it um, with a headline. The police disproves the fact of rape. Uh, somebody pu publishes it in a Facebook group, uh, so in a couple of hours there, weren't, there was no hype anymore. Because you see, it's not usual that somebody rapes a girl in Mardo. Uh, we have no migrants 
there. Uh, we believe usually our police and our media, and there's no neg negative background in the media. We don't expect it actually to happen in Mardo. So it's easy to control and to cal calm down the people. And the situation could, not, could be very different in different conditions. For example, we read about a girl who was raped by a mi migrant in Germany. Shall we believe it? Okay. Uh, if there was a preparation, if you don't believe your media, um, if um, some problems exist, you may, you may believe it. Everybody remembers uh, scandal Liza case uh, in Berlin in uh, 2016. Well, okay, it was in spite, it was faked um, and used by Russian propaganda, but uh, it would not be possible without the context. There are three crucial moments in spreading and disproof of a fake. First of all, uh, the context matters. Second, is there anybody who wants to use this situation? And third, you have to believe your media and your state officials. And um, here we come back to the problem of uh, credibility. Do the people believe our media? Actually, they do, as researchers say. But it's not actually enough. And mainstream media itself um, sometimes uh, discredited, destroys its um, credibility. For example, Do, Russian, do Russians from uh, Last Name believe um, Estonian online media when it writes of uh, their district in the most negative way? Here you can see on the left, for example, the classic uh, example. Um, okay, it's uh, just imagination, but uh, sometimes we can uh, read such an article in Estonian um, mass media that uh, Last Name is a ghetto is populated of, by the people like that. And uh, on the right is actually his actual picture. It's uh, Last Nakino, people watching uh, cinema in my district. So you see no problem, no ghetto, it's all okay. But uh, it's not the far right uh, media outlet. It's, it's, it's mainstream, it's my own media, right, about all that. So when I read about it in Postimus, I usually begin, uh, begin to begin thinking, Am I right? Uh, do I have uh, to translate it or to publish it in Russian just to show there is such an opinion, just uh, to keep our information space common? Well, I don't do it. Usually I go to my Estonian colleague, my chief, uh, we're talking about it, uh, and usually they agree that it must be edited, edited, but it doesn't mean that I will never see, see such thing again. It's a problem. To build up an integrated society, I have to show some respect. And maybe it's better not to show some points of view too often, just not to propagate it, even if it brings you clicks, money, and cheap popularity. We cannot imagine a story in New York Times where black population is described in a most offensive way. In developed democracy, it's a fail. Here it is not. Media cannot be successful in building up an integrated society if special aspects of the target groups are not taken into account. This summer, Russian Postimus organized a panel discussion at the Festival of Opinions in Paida. We talked about the image of Russia in Estonian media. If you analyze the context in which Russia and Russians exist in Estonian information space, it will be Putin, Crimea, information war, hackers, fake news, uh, Russia wants uh, to manipulate US election and so on. Okay, it's all true, but I don't, I don't want to exist in such, such a negative information space. There's Russian culture, there's so many things to speak about. So, if we can create a comfortable, credible information space for everyone, the problem of propaganda and fake news won't be so serious. Alternative media is successful only when the mainstream has discredited itself. You can blame social media, you can blame foreign propaganda, but you can deny the f cannot deny the fact that you are, that you Pro provoked it yourself. So mainstream media produ is producing too much noise that people d doesn't want to think. And it's a problem. It's not a problem of information space. It's, it's a problem of common cultural space. And I think I, we have to create it. Thank you. Uh, I am, it's my third time at this conference. And uh, from time to time, I hear this kind of uh, 
opinions, and I heard them this time as well. Why do you always have to talk so much about Russians and Russian speakers? And isn't isn't it actually? Uh, Uh, well, some people say that a that, uh, matter of integration doesn't have anything to do with Russian speakers in Estonia or in Baltic countries in general. Uh, and I'm happy now <laughs> to say that there is someone who is not going to talk about Russian speakers particularly, I guess. Uh, so, Digis, the stage is yours. Do you hear me? Is it okay? Okay, good. Uh, first, uh, a few words about myself. I work for UN Refugee Agency, or the very, very short way to say it is UNHCR, as you may be sometimes hear in media. And, and uh, of course, there are many different UN agencies and, and uh, different names, and, and sometimes it's, it's confusing. So our mandate is, is to, uh, to ensure protection of people who are, as we say, displaced. Uh, globally, in any country, any region, it doesn't matter, including, of course, also uh, the Baltic states. Um, and I work specifically at a regional office, which is located in Stockholm, and we cover eight countries of uh, a region that is called Northern Europe. So these, these are five Nordic countries and three Baltic countries. Uh, I am myself from Latvia originally, and uh, I work uh, within UNHCR with media. Uh, so I answer media requests, I help journalists to find information about refugees. Uh, and, and we try also to organize journalist trainings and things like that. And we also try to reach out to the general public and try to explain what a refugee is and, and what we are uh, trying to, to do to help them. Um, and I'm also a spokesperson for Estonia and Latvia. So that is very, very shortly uh, about uh, myself. Um, so about this common information space, of course, I mean, my specialty is, is uh, refugees. So I will try to talk about some interesting moments uh, that appear when we talk about how to include this particular group in the common information space. Because, of course, as uh, any group or any individual, if you live in a given society, given uh, country, you deserve also to be included in, in the common information space. I think that's a no-brainer, and it, it uh, applies also to refugees. Now, uh, first, a little bit about the context, because, uh, and I will speak specifically about uh, Estonia and Latvia, because that, that is my, my work field, so to say, uh, because the context here is uh, a little bit specific uh, and very, very different also from other countries in, in, in the region. Uh, first of all, uh, the numbers of refugees are tiny. Uh, according to our own statistics, in uh, roughly 20 years, that's the time uh, since uh, both countries ratified refugee convention and it was uh, possible to apply for asylum. So in Estonia, 411 people granted refugee status. 411 in 20 years. In Latvia, slightly more, 662. Also, we can agree it's a tiny number. So uh, this makes, of course, this group of people uh, vulnerable in itself. I mean, if you take it just a very small group and then you try to depict them in media and so on, they, they feel maybe even threaten and so on. And, and also, sometimes they just don't want to talk to media. They, they, they feel they, they belong to a very small community. Um, so also, both countries have very short experience of refugee reception and also integration. 20 years, it's nothing. If you compare to countries like Sweden, who have been accepting refugees for years and years since Second World War from different countries, they have... Uh, all experienced a number of challenges that Estonia and Latvia are just starting to experience. Uh, so this is also an interesting context that we need to uh, take into account. Uh, then, of course, media. What I didn't say in the beginning, I, I'm also a former journalist, so uh, I, I, I have been working for uh, radio, print, web, uh, also in different languages, uh, also English, Swedish. Um, but the interest 
of, of media, and also specifically if you talk about uh, coverage from abroad, from different countries, uh, which of course were much, much, much more affected uh, by uh, refugees arriving, for example, Greece or Italy, uh, for a number of reasons, among them, of course, also the resources, mainly financial resources. You have to pay for a journalist trip to far away. Uh, the, that coverage was very, very limited. And I'm not even talking uh, about faraway places like uh, Lebanon or Syria or Turkey. Uh, of course, 2015 was a little bit a game changer because then we understood with the European so-called refugee crisis. I say so-called because also in the Baltic countries, the numbers are still very small. So uh, one uh, migration scholar in a conference in Riga uh, a couple of years ago said the following, that we in the Baltics have managed to create a refugee crisis without refugees. Uh, so. Um, so of course the interest of media has been on the rise, and uh, also we as organization, we have helped a number of refugees to go and report from abroad. So it has become better, but still there is a difference uh, from other, uh, for example, European countries. Um, then of course, since also because of these tiny numbers, um, most of the locals have never seen a refugee. And I think it's gonna stay like that for quite some time and, and of course it's a, it's a little, little bit of a dilemma. No, nobody wants the country to experience a huge influx but then if you have just 400 persons and some of them are most probably not in the country anymore, um, so many people will not have direct contact with refugees so everything that they think is from the television, uh, internet and uh, most of them not even from Estonian or Latvian context. Um, but then the last thing that I, I think it's, it's a little bit uh, peculiar one because uh, both Estonians and Latvians have been refugees themselves and uh, quite on a big scale. Uh, just to mention one example, about 40,000 from Estonia and Latvia uh, went to Sweden by the end of the Second World War using boats. I guess it resembles something that happens in the Mediterranean now. And also just to remember, not all of them, who those who tried, did succeed. And also not all of them, and not always were maybe that well received. There were also some voices against them. Uh, in uh, maybe more leftist Swedish press, there were, there were even some mentions of uh, possible influx of fascist collaborators. This, I think, also reminds of something, oh, these are Syrians, maybe there are some ISIS fighters, you know how it goes. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of similar, but I think not many make this connection. And of course, we have to understand there are also differences because at that time there was no refugee convention. And of course, all of these pap people were arriving in Sweden and elsewhere without any valid paperwork. So it's, it's, I think, important to, to remember that as well. So that is, that is the context in which we operate and, and, and try to include these refugees in the common information space and try to show them also that these people exist and, and uh, they have their stories, they are also human beings, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this uh, creates, uh, not, not only because of the specific local, context. This applies also globally, because we as organization, UNHCR, we also say very often, and it's true, uh, I'm not trying to challenge it in any way, um, that refugees there are just like us. They're ordinary people, but they happen to be in extraordinary situation, right? The war is at your doorstep. What do you do? You pack your bag if you can manage and you just leave. You leave your friends, you leave your family, you leave your country, you often take a very dangerous journey, and so on. So you're an ordinary human being, you had a job, you maybe were a student, you were a mother, a father, and then everything changed. Uh, but then again, refugees are also a, a vulnerable group. It's a little bit of a contradiction, right? Um, because many of them, why do they flee? Because they are persecuted maybe because of their 
ethnicity, because of their religion, because of their sexual orientation. So they are also, from the very beginning, they belong to a minority. And then they end up in a, in a completely different country. Uh, and of course, they, they are vulnerable as a group, by definition. Uh, then, of course, they, their voices need to be heard, just as um, I think it's also a no-brainer. Of course, we can go into the details, but media in general should be a little bit like a mirror of the society, right? If there are refugees, they should be also, to some extent, in media, and they deserve to tell their own stories. But then again, uh, refugees are under what we call, and I think not not many uh, understand what it really means practically, under international protection. International because no single country can provide full protection to refugees. Uh, countries have to cooperate. And uh, that is also what the Refugee Convention says. Um, but what it means uh, practically, uh, just to give you some examples, when the person applies for asylum. So that's that's the moment when you enter another state's territory and you say, hey, here, here am I, I'm being persecuted, there is a war, there is this and that. I want to be protected. And uh, at that moment, your status is asylum seeker. The country that is, is reviewing your application has an obligation to protect information on you. Your country of origin is not supposed to know that you applied for asylum. Why? Not because we automatically assume that country is bad. No, because, because of different reasons, you know, patriotism, whatever, a given country might not like that, oh, this person is, is in a, another country and he's complaining about us. Even if it's not true, even if a person is then rejected, he or she might experience trouble if the information is leaked and they are sent back or go back to their country of origin. So here it's, you see, you see how it, it, it all becomes a little bit problematic. Refugees' voices need to be heard, but then again, you need to sometimes protect them. And also, if you already have refugee status, you maybe have family, you have friends in your country of origin. So maybe you don't want to tell that you are in Estonia and being a refugee, because maybe your member of your family will get killed just because of that. So also, and, and when I say that the country has to also work to uh, protect these in individuals, it's not only the government. Everybody should understand and should try to, uh, try to figure out what do we do in this particular case. So it's a little bit tricky, all of it. That's, that's why I, I, I would like to call this, this, this whole idea of let's include them, but let's be careful. It's, it's a kind of dilemma, right? So, uh, what to do? I just try to think about it, and, and uh, here is my uh, few reflection points. Um, the first one is, is, of course, refugees can be uh, described as a group. Right, but each of them have their own story. Each of them is an individual. Right now, we have 68.5 million displaced people in the world. You can understand that you cannot uh, treat them as as um, in, in the same way, right? Um, so that that is one thing. Let's try to still treat them as individuals. The next one is, is uh, and here I'm trying to be very careful. I, I'm not trying to criticize media, but everybody makes mistakes, and, and, and uh, so do journalists as well. Uh, media can harm refugees even without having the intent. They just don't know. They don't know the situation in their home country, for example. They publish something. They publish it in a context that doesn't really work out. So, good intent, they want to, oh, let's show this refugee, he's so nice, and it ends up badly. Uh, then, uh, refugee, being a refugee, it's, it's not, not your main identity, it's not your core of your being. 
Um, all refugees have a profession, education, they have their own religion, they have their own ethnicity, etc., etc. So being a refugee, it's hopefully, it's just a parenthesis, you know. And here I want to mention uh, an example from my own life. I studied many years in Sweden, and in a student dorm, a guy moved in, and he was from Bosnia. And we became very good friends in our still, and uh, he, he was such a funny and a very bright guy. And, and he studied at Stockholm School of Economics, and uh, he has been so successful in his life. This year, there were elections in Sweden. He was on the ballot, and I was just so, ha so happy to see all his posts on Facebook, and he was having a very vibrant campaign. Uh, but oh, even he had told me, the whole story, how they fled with the family. He was a teenager at the time. First they lived, because there were so many refugees uh, arriving from former Yugoslavia at that point. In, in Sweden, they had to put up tents. So they even spent some time in tents. And so on and so forth. But I never really thought of him as about a refugee. For me, he was a fellow student, a funny guy, you know, friend. Refugee, that was the last thing on the list. So this is important to understand. And also many, many refugees, when they talk to us, but also when they talk to media, they don't want to talk to, oh, I'm a refugee. They want to say, well, I was a doctor in Syria and I was doing this and that and I was having a fantastic career and, and I have this and that hobby and I like to play guitar or whatever. They want to tell many, many different things. Um, so let's not fo forget about that. A refugee, hopefully, just a parenthesis. And then uh, language, of course, it's, it's a hard one uh, because it collides a little bit with the freedom of press and, and, and uh, freedom of speech. Of course, everybody is entitled to have opinions and express them. Uh, but when people talk about illegal migrants, or I have even seen people using in media expressions like illegal asylum seeker or illegal refugee, you know, I. I I can't take it because no human being is, is, is illegal. And when trying to explain this also to journalists, that yes, you can actually cross the border without a visa and apply for asylum. That's fully okay. And that such person should not even be punished. And I always say, are there illegal uh, journalists, illegal lawyers, illegal policemen, illegal doctors? We don't say that. Even if a doctor is practicing without a license, we don't say illegal doctor. We would try to describe it, but somehow with the migrants and refugees, we say they are illegal. No human being is illegal, full stop. Uh, and and uh, such language, I mean, actually, it, it simply stigmatizes them. Yeah? So it's, if we want to include them, this is just the opposite. Um, and the last one, I mean, it, it happens so often. There is a huge article about refugees, and there is not a single refugee talking. And actually, also this uh, latest discussion, mainly, of course, uh, uh, it, it is about a global compact on migration. But people, of course, are mixing up. There are two global compacts at the moment to, to be adopted, one on migration, one on refugees. It's two different doc documents. Uh, first of all, mixed together, of course, but um, as, as much as I have seen in Estonian media, I have never seen a, a single migrant or refugee voicing what they think about this compact. So I think for me, it's like it's, it's, it's a natural thing to ask a refugee or a migrant, what do you think about this? But everybody else is talking, politicians, journalists, opinion makers, not a refugee. But of course, not, not only with this particular topic, but also many other times. Often articles about refugee integration. You have the whole article. And people working with refugees are talking, but refugees, empty. Um, so finally, a little bit uh, about what, what, what does this protection mean practically and how to put it into, in, into media and, and uh, common, common information, space, uh, context. Uh, I think you recognize who is uh, in the photo? 
It's one of the Pussy Riot members. It was just the other week she was on uh, Swedish television uh, in a program about literature because her book has just come out. And in the very beginning, and I was like, uh, oh, that, that's interesting. Uh, what, what is she talking about? Because she said, oh, I almost didn't make it to Sweden because she's at the moment forbidden to exit. And the journalist asked, oh, but how did you, how did you come here? And she said, no, uh, I arrived on a pink pony. I always use a pink pony to travel. And that was it. You know, and this, of course, she's not a refugee, but there, there is another Pussy Riot member in Sweden at the moment as asylum seeker, so it's not completely disconnected. Um, so uh, many refugees also don't want to d reveal all the details, how they traveled, where they stopped, and so on, often for simply security reasons, and this needs to be understood. Uh, so in the context of protection, we have to understand that each refugee owns their own story, right? I mean, my profession is talk to media, right? I have to answer all the emails, I have to always pick up the phone and so on. Private individuals, also re refugees, they don't have this obligation. If they don't want to talk to media, or if they say, I, I will tell you the story, but this is how it goes, this is how I want to tell it, they have the right to do that. Uh, I'll try to wrap up. <laughs> uh, talking about the context, um, Refugees and also other people who arrive in the country, they don't know the context. So we really have to try to explain to, to them how this will be publicized. Maybe they don't want to be on the first, on the front page of the newspaper, but they would agree to be some, somewhere else and so on. Is it an interview? Is it an article where you, we'll just take one quote from you? It's important because otherwise uh, it, it becomes problematic. Um, so uh, being anonymous also, I mean, often they, they, ju they just have to. They have family in the home country, they cannot show their face. And it's all possible, technically. I have seen such wonderful uh, uh, TV reports where person is shown as a human being, but they film from such an angle, you, you will never figure out who that person is. So it's all possible, and uh, if it's needed, we have to do it. Um, and also for journalists, just I remember in 2015 when the whole thing just exploded, I got a lot of questions from journalists. Also, of course, what is a refugee? What is asylum seeker? What is the difference? What is refugee convention? How does it work? But also about the countries of origin. And this is something that you can just uh, read about and just try to educate yourself. What is happening in Eritrea? Why people free, flee from there? Oh, there is no war, yes, but it's like a very totalitarian state, right? So we have to understand where they come from. That always uh, gives, uh, gives a better, better understanding of, of these people also as individuals. So and finally, maybe there are some alternative ways how to tell their stories and include them. Uh, one thing is what we do. We try to present uh, personal stories uh, on our internet site. Uh, this picture that you see, that is uh, a girl, her name is Naimo. She's now living in Iceland, but she's from Somalia. And she's uh, what is called the uh, influencer. She's a lot of, on YouTube and so on. She's 20 years old. She, fled from Somalia because she was, uh, they tried to put her into a forced marriage. She was just 11 years old. So she escaped and she's such a brilliant personality. She deserves to be out and show, you know, what, what, what she thinks and what, what, what she wants to achieve. Another one, Living Libraries, it's, it's a uh, project, uh, I think, in a number of countries. Uh, I have seen it in Latvia, where refugees are invited and uh, locals are invited. It's a quasi closed environment, it's safe environment where, where people can talk openly and it's not published on the front page of the newspaper uh, later. So people can come and see refugees and hear their stories. And uh, there can be many examples, but uh, children books, this one is actually made by uh, Elon Wickland, who is from uh, Estonia, but she arrived in Sweden as a child as a refugee during Second World War. And this is actually, it doesn't really say it, but it's a story about her. And a five-year-old can, can understand this. It's a lot of, a lot of pictures and, and very little text, but it's also, I think, for adults. Uh, it's a very emotional story how 
how she ended up in Sweden and also succeeded later. And many, many different ways, but also important to, to ask refugees themselves. What do you think? How, how can we give you your voice? How can we make you participate? It's important always to, to, to ask, ask that. So that was all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Didis. Uh, some examples of common spaces. Uh, I thought, well, we don't have much time, but I have. Uh, I think we will use any time we need to discuss if we, if we have questions. I, I would ask the first question. I thought first to ask something very philosophical. <laughs> but um, actually, I came up with a better idea because uh, myself, I work partly uh, at a national broadcast uh, television company reading news in a minority language which is which happened to be russian in finland and uh, uh, reading the topic of our discussion i took uh, somehow the three uh, three views three points of views uh, state community individual so we have to think about these common spaces from those points of view. And uh, I mean, working at this national company reading uh, news in Russian feels very cool for me. I mean, uh, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm proud, but at least I'm very thankful for the opportunity because I learn a lot. Uh, uh, I enjoy it so far, at least. Uh, but if I ask uh, my friends, my Russian speakers living in Finland, uh, do they watch, watch this every day? What do you think? So I guess the most amount of people watching actually on the TV, the, the, the news, would be uh, Finnish people wanting to learn Russian, because that would be a, a text be below, uh, or Finnish people who put their TV on because they don't want to miss uh, Finnish news that comes after that. Uh, and then I ask myself, where is the connection between state, which provides such a great thing, with some money, I wouldn't say with a lot of money, but with some money uh, uh, to the community of uh, some target group of Russian speakers who are actually built from individuals, or which is built from individuals. And when, when is the question, what actually those individuals really need? And do, are they asked what they need? Well, actually, I, as a representative of Russian-speaking society in Finland, before this uh, news in Russian was even uh, created, I was asked, my opinion was asked twice, what do I think of that? So we, pl we are planning to do this. Uh, and um, I gave some answer, I'm not going to repeat it, but uh, what actually came out was completely different, completely else what, what I and some other experts told. And well, I'm wondering uh, how to connect these three uh, things, which are somehow they are connected, somehow they have to be connected, but somehow I don't see the connection when, when I think even about myself working. And so what, what do you think? Uh, is, is it th three completely different spaces? Are they separated from each other? And how we can use these common spaces, information spaces, to, to kind of uh, find this connection again, maybe? Well, um, I may start with my experiences uh, being editor-in-chief of the Russian language unit at the Latvian Public Television. So, uh, the situation when this unit was created kind of reminds the situation when ETV Plus was created. So, the first obstacle in order to address Russian-speaking audience was lack of trust. And we can talk about state, individual, group level, but when you do not have trust between those levels, why is state suddenly thinking about me as a Russian-speaking individual, providing me finally with some information in Russian on public television? Is it because of the year 2014? Probably yes. Then do I trust this kind of information? And do I trust this kind of state which uh, had an idea uh, to talk to me only out of this situation? And the budget that was given to create this additional public television Russian speaking unit was out of unexpected, um, unexpected um, expenses. The, the out of unexpected expenses to address Russian-speaking audiences. So I think that um, 
we can talk about levels. If there is no trust between levels, we should create it. The next question, how, but... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will guess. Yeah. <laughs> we will need a lot of money mm -hmm. to create it. Mm. Because it's all about content that you produce, that you, that you offer to your audience. Actually, I agree. It's, 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 it's all about money. And I think if a given state has, uh, has the, the, the resources, they, they should be producing media content in, in as, as many languages as, as they can. In Sweden, uh, the public service radio, I think at the moment, has broadcastings in like 15 languages, including Russian. And I don't think the Russian community in Sweden is, is that huge. I mean, there are some, but still. And I think one uh, aspect, uh, which is of course not not maybe then about people who live in the country, is that uh, people outside the country can use this content. You know, people who don't don't understand Swedish, but they can access the information, which is also on the website in Russian. They can be in Russia or in Latvia or Estonia, and this is also the chance for the given state to. Um, to try to present itself also towards outside. But that, that of course, goes a little bit uh, uh, outside the scope of, of uh, our discussion. But, uh, but yes, I think in general, if you, if you have the resources, uh, why not? And, and if you have some by effects that somebody uh, who wants to learn the language can listen to it, uh, watch it, why not? I don't see any harm. But, I think what, 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 what we have seen also particularly in Latvia, but I think in Estonia as well, that, that there is some kind of uh, gap between, okay, let's produce a content in that language, but the audience, uh, of course, the, the language matches, but the content is somehow not reaching them. So there is, this needs to be somehow fixed. So maybe also they need to be engaged and ask even more times, what exactly do you think uh, should be in the content? Mm -hmm. That's interesting that you brought up the money and importance of resources because, uh, I mean, the, the politically, the gesture of uh, my example, for example, it looks very nice to present. I mean, we are taking care of our Russian-speaking minority in Finland. We have news in Russian on TV, on the first channel. But uh, if you think that the budget of fiction on the national broadcast television, one day of, of because they're making films and serials and, and such stuff, so one day of this budget is like many times more than one year of our budget. <laughs> And I think that this is, uh, this, it tells you something about priorities and, and the actual importance uh, of, of, the, of the thing for... But actually the fiction is, uh, is important because it attracts people. Yes, exactly. Uh, they, they watch fiction, then they, exactly. they watch your news. Yeah. But if, if I may, may, may add, uh, I just said that resources are important, but of course financial resources, but there are other ways also to include people from different uh, minority groups uh, into the mainstream uh, media. And, and one very nice way is to include them, let's say you have a newspaper in Estonian, but you have <coughs> Russian speakers working in that newspaper, right? And it, 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 uh, it can be applied to, to many different groups. I know in Sweden, I keep repeating Sweden because I have spent so many years there and I just know the society. Um, uh, transgender people, you know, I mean, the discussion has, has changed positively so much because they started instead of trying to, oh yeah, they read up about transgender people rights and then they try to make an article, but, oh, but maybe we should ask somebody who is transgender, hey, here is an article, what do you think about it? Is it, is it okay? Uh, or, or maybe we should change something, the language, you know, transgender people are very sensitive towards the language, do, do you write he or she or they and so on, and it has become so much better because they included those people themselves, you know, and also, I mean, these, these things I said about refugees, maybe somebody doesn't want to re reveal he or she is a refugee, and the same with transgender people, some of them, okay, they have changed the gender and they insist on that, that you know, if I don't want to tell about my my previous identity, I just don't. And you know, it's even rude to ask, right? So, and this this all was achieved just by including these people who were also journalists. So, if you find Russian speakers who are journalists, uh, refugees who are journalists, 
uh, gays who are journalists take them in. No, they actually want to be in the media. I personally know some trans transgenders, uh, they will never agree to talk with me in the, in the media officially. But to work They prefer media. not to discuss about But uh, this is a very important question that you brought up about uh, public language or changing the language. Because when we in Latvia talk about um, Russian speaking or Russian language uh, people relations and Latvians, we always say uh, they, us, uh, us, they. <laughs> and this non-inclusiveness, which is embedded in the language itself, others, they, <laughs> are those, Russians, you know, or those Latvians. So it's uh, it's a matter of probably even inventing a better language about integration. You know, we all know that integration is a swear word in in the Baltics. Uh, why? Because it's overused. Because it doesn't work anymore. So what about inventing the language about non like uh, I think the politicians mentioned non citizens non-Estonians, mm. non-Latvians. I mean, why? Mm. <laughs> you know. Let's talk about people and humanities. <laughs> okay, Let's thank you. I mean, we have still some time, and if none of you ask a question, I will ask my philosophical question, and we'll sit here until six o'clock. Thank you very much. You're saving us. <laughs> <From me>. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Birgit Lys from the Estonian Ministry of Interior. I have a question to UNHR, actually. Um, and the question is, have you discussed inside of your organization of what you could do more uh, in terms of media proactively? Because um, you mentioned the migration compact, and it's very lively discussed in the media these days. And I don't think that in today's media and society, it's anymore it's not enough to post positive stories in UNHR's web page. You have to be more proactive and I'm just thinking whether you have also thought about what you could do more because when ministries post or um, uh, kind of focus on the misinterpretations in the media, it's it might be labeled as propaganda because we are the government's uh, agencies, but um, but we need other actors to be more involved and to, to really fight with those misinterpretations that are so common these days. Thank you. Thank you very much. You actually partly asked my philosophical <laughs> question. Oh. Uh, yes, uh, of course, this, uh, I, could all, I would also simply agree, right, that we always need to do something more. Uh, then again, for UN in general, uh, we have to be a little bit careful because we, we don't work against any government, any, and I really mean any. Not even, uh, some people don't like Donald Trump, some people don't like Bashar Assad. We are not the ones who will go out and criticize a given regime. We have to work with all the countries to ensure protection of refugees, that's, uh, that's the main goal. Uh, so we have to be more, much more balanced, uh, much more careful, uh, than, for example, Amnesty International. So uh, reasonably, you cannot expect us to be the, you know, this campaigner uh, and and demanding a change uh, kind of organization. We are trying to help. I think what what we need to do more in countries like Estonia and Latvia, we need to do to to work in closer cooperation with the governments, also towards media. And uh, trust me, it's, it's not only that if you send out a press release that it can be uh, regarded as propaganda, it's the same with us. It's UN, it's coming from outside, it's a global conspiracy, it's George Soros, everything. And, and um, since, I mean, we are international organization, we are all from different countries and, and I have seen comments, you know, uh, some colleagues who are from this or that country and then somebody just doesn't like them. So we have to just just uh, live with that, and um, yeah. But but uh, I agree. We we need to uh, to be more more proactive, and we need to uh, to uh, work uh, in a closer cooperation. And of course, the downside is that we do not have permanent staff in Estonia and Latvia. 
That's a real downside. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be changed. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no, but it's not really on my level of decision. I hope yes, because that's, a, that's already a game changer. I know it from my uh, personal experience with, with journalists. If you are there, they will reach out to you much more often than if, as now, I sit in Stockholm mainly, and, and then ch j just uh, come over. So I hope I somewhat answered your question. To bring the question a little bit further, uh, I think the saddest thing about dealing with challenges is actually that we uh, react on something that has already happened uh, instead of trying to make it not happening. So do you, uh, Alessia and Olga, do you have any idea how, how we can use the, this common uh, information spaces uh, to make them more preactive instead of reactive? As I what said, it has to be a cultural space, and it's all about humanity. So we are talking too much about the issues that are actually not important. If you're always talking about money, about uh, clicks, about uh, cheap popularity, it doesn't work. I think uh, it's it's all because of our ignorance. Uh, we have uh, to promote humanities at the universities. Uh, they're not popular at the moment. It's a, it's a cultural problem. Well, um, I worked on, a, on one document uh, with the special committee of the Latvian president. We made an audit of integrational efforts in Latvia uh, during the last 20 years. So it sounds awful, <laughs> but uh, we came to a very uh, one of the very simple conclusions that we lack natural spaces of mixed communication between communities. So we can talk about you know, artificial spaces, media spaces, information spaces, uh, but we lack uh, natural communication spaces for kids, for example. They're st still segregated into uh, different educational systems, schools. For example, kindergarten is still there. Uh, and um, in Latvia, we have a very big percentage of mixed marriages between Latvians and uh, non-Latvians. <laughs> Forgive my language. Uh, and that shows that in this natural environments, many more problems are uh, discussed and uh, developed further <laughs> than in artificial spaces. So. Um, Let's have more shared natural spaces of communication. Mm -hmm. And if, if I may add also, I mean, you touched a little bit upon uh, the question of education. And I think that's, that's important. I mean, matters like, I'm talking about my, my field, obviously, uh, migration and, and refugees need to be discussed already in school. Mm. Right. I mean, I, I think we who grew up still more or less in, in Soviet Union, I mean, I spent my most of my school years in Soviet Union and also experienced that, you know, we, we, we don't, didn't get any valid information on, on, on migration and refugees at all, or to speak of history and all, all these things. So the, these topics need to be included. And uh, when, when people say, no, but it is sensitive, you will be brainwashing kids and so on. Wait a second. They are out on the internet. They are out on social media. They watch television. They see what is happening in Greece and Italy. And the result is uh, oh, one of the kids in my family, uh, he was, we were just walking in a, in a supermarket and he was, oh, that's a terrorist. I was like, wait a second, what did you just say? It was, that, that man looked uh, a little bit maybe like you, you know, a little bit, a little bit darker. And I was like, what did you just, just say? Why? And he's like, well, but he looked like he's from, um, some Arab Muslim countries. And I talked more and I understood that he has been just watching some YouTube videos and nobody's explaining to him what is what. And he's just drawing conclusions very, very quickly. There is time for one question more and then we have to close. Yeah, my name is Rao Edik. I come from Tallinn University. I would like to comment uh, Olesia's uh, presentation. I liked it uh, very much. It was short, uh, sharp and, 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 and smart. And I'd like to ask, or, or just uh, uh, discuss one point you uh, made. Uh, uh, you, you said that it is uh, difficult for Russian journalists uh, in Estonia to criticize uh, Estonian government. 
uh, if mm. I think there are two sides. One, one side is like, you know, we live uh, in a Western democracy, we have civil society, civil society should have voice, etc., etc. Another side of this issue is uh, security context, in the context of sharpening geopolitical conflict between Russia and the West, uh, it is uh, understandable where, you know, this uh, pressure uh, comes. But I would like to argue that if Russian journalists in Estonia do not criticize Estonian authorities, this is a security threat for Estonia. Because if you do not do that, then your audience does not uh, trust you. And, and probably this is one of the reasons why Russian language people in Estonia follow Moscow news, not uh, uh, Tallinn news. So just, I think, we, we, we should try to argue that listening to the voice of Russian language population is in security interest uh, in Estonia, because right now it, it, it comes like vice versa. We are, we are told that, you know, we, we live in tough security context and, 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 and that is why you need to shut down. I think our argument should be that it is exactly vice versa. Actually, we do criticize Estonian government. We criticize uh, everyone who is worth it. <laughs> but uh, maybe the problem is that uh, Russian um, editorial teams um, doesn't have um, so many resources uh, to make its own opinion loud. Uh, the, the biggest problem is we are always uh, translating something from Estonian language. We don't have, we don't have resources to produce uh, something that's, uh, that is our own content. Uh, th this is a problem, especially in a private media. Okay, I'm afraid we have to close because we uh, actually the time is, has been up for a, long, a longer time. I'm, I'm, I thank you very much. It was for me at least very interesting. I hope for, for those who are so brave to still sit here, <laughs> it, was, it was not less interesting. And if you want to discuss more, then of, of course we will be for some time drinking coffee. Thank you very much.